It's a well-documented fact that 2023 was a great year for games. The PC was no exception. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the top 30 best PC games of 2023. Starting off with number 30, it's Resident Evil 4. How else would we start this off? It's a remake, so it's a new game, and it does a lot to spin the original Resident Evil 4, but it's built on top of an incredibly stable foundation that changed games forever back when the original came out. The Resi 4 remake is just a perfect example of how you can kind of remix without losing what made the game incredible in the first place, even building on it and maybe making it a little better, at least in some ways. And number 29 is Lethal Company, a co-op horror game where you and several friends' jobs is to collect some scrap from some abandoned moons that used to be factorial in nature. I don't know how to put it. They had resource operations going on these moons and they don't have them going anymore. And it's cause there's nasty stuff living on these moons. This game isn't like the most realistic looking game of all time, but what it's got is atmosphere. There's a lot of different ways to experience it, but it's always thick enough to cut with a knife. And number 28 is Octopath Traveler 2. If you're anything like me, you really like old JRPGs, and Octopath Traveler is, I mean, the premier version of that in 2023, right? 2024 too, I guess now. Square didn't screw us over on this one though, ported it to the PC and it looks incredible. I was a huge fan of the original Octopath Traveler, and I think Octopath Traveler 2 even goes further in achieving the goals of the project. Like, I hope eventually all old JRPGs are remade in this style. It's amazing. At number 27, it's the finals. I have wasted so much time playing the finals. When I am done recording this list, I will continue to waste time playing the finals because I haven't played the finals yet today. This game is kind of a weird competition game show first person shooter where the idea is to cash out various vaults and doing so enough times to either win the match or having time run out with the most points. Sounds pretty simple, but it's incredible. If you want to talk about a first person multiplayer shooter done right, it's this one. There's nothing else like the finals. They've taken so many other ideas and turned them into a cohesive streamlined thing and put it in destructible environments that ensure that every single match is different. It's incredible. Play the finals. And number 26 is the System Shock remake, which does way more than the Resident Evil 4 remake does to make System Shock into a modern, playable game. Because if you go back to the original System Shock, while it does have its charm, its systems are archaic as hell. It came out before first-person control schemes were standardized on either keyboard and mouse or gamepad, and it's not really a first-person shooter, but it also is. This game basically inspired an entire subgenre, the immersive sim, and the remake makes it something that you can actually go back to and play without being incredibly frustrated because nothing works like how anything else works in any other game. I love System Shock and I love the remake because I don't like going back to System Shock. I just have all these fond memories of it, but the remake makes it so that it feels like a game again. And number 25 is Blasphemous 2, a Metroidvania that really expands upon all of the ideas of the first. Uh, there are some people who think it maybe deserved a more original story because it's kind of more of the same from the first one, but I maintain that if you like the first one, you'll probably really like the second one unless you really hate the idea that the story is going to be more of the same. I don't really play Metroidvanias for the story. Sometimes I do, I'm not going to say I never do, but as long as the story is serviceable, and the gameplay is great, I think a Metroidvania has basically accomplished what it set out to do. In that way, I think Blasphemous 2 is better than Blasphemous 1, and I would highly recommend giving it a shot. And number 24 is Remnant 2, the Souls-like with guns 2. Is it bigger? Is it better? Is it badder than the first? Absolutely. Remnant 2 is a fantastic sequel, if not maybe a little demanding on the machine. I have a pretty damn good PC and uh, this game really makes use of it, let's say. It probably could be better optimized and that would probably be a good thing, but that's really the only complaint. 
because on every other possible metric, this game is fantastic. Souls like with guns. What else are you going to say? They did it. They did it right. The bosses are good. Some of them are incredible. And aside from the frame rate, it's one of those games that always feels incredibly fluid. Remnant 2 is a must if you like Souls likes and shooting, period. And number 23, it's Trap Bang 2. Hey, did you want more fear? Because it's here in the form of Trap Bang 2, or I guess Trap Bang Squared, or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. If you like the crazy, lunatic shooting of fear with all the bullet time and the gore, Trap Bang 2 or Square is the closest thing to it that you can possibly get right now. It is phenomenal. And number 22 is Amnesia the Bunker, set in World War I in, you guessed it, a bunker. Amnesia adds some elements, for instance, a gun, but uh, don't think that this is a first-person shooter. Ammo is uh, not easy to come by at all. It's very much a successor to Amnesia. You are not going to feel like you're playing a game called Amnesia, but actually a first-person shooter or anything like that. It does also feature what they call the semi-open world and some immersive sim elements, which I think really suits what they're trying to do with this game. I'm not 100% sure I would call it as scary as previous games if that's why you're playing it, but I don't play these games because they're scary. I play them because they have interesting stories and the setting is very strange. And this one lives up to that in spades. And number 21 is Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. I have made it very clear that Avatar is not a thing I even kind of like, and I like Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. So, in my opinion, it accomplishes so much as a Ubisoft open world game. Now, this isn't to say it's somehow shockingly different from their other games, but for whatever reason, it came together really well. I think it's in no small part due to Pandora being a very good location for this type of a game. Am I going to call it the best Ubisoft open world game? Eh, probably not. But considering I just want nothing to do with Avatar ever and I enjoyed this game, I think it's saying a lot. And number 20 is the Crew Motorfest. It's been a while since we got a Crew game. 2018 was the last one. And Motorfest really takes the franchise in a great new direction, where the Crew 2 gave us a very scaled down map of the contiguous United States. The Crew Motorfest gives us a much more dense recreation of Oahu. In terms of structure, it's clearly inspired by Forza Horizon, and also keeping in mind that several developers from Ubisoft Ivory Tower, the crew developers, also worked on the Test Drive Unlimited games, and Test Drive Unlimited 2 took place on Oahu. Now, this is obviously a much more advanced, pretty version of that, but it's a great revisit to the place, and I'm sure the developers put a lot of thought into the fact that there would be some expectations attached to that. I think they nailed it. The Crew Motor Fest is a great game. And number 19 is Cocoon from the developer of Limbo and Inside. This is a puzzle adventure where you can leap between worlds with this very strange mechanic where you carry worlds on your back with an orb. I, I know that probably sounds like total nonsense. It's not, it's actually pretty intuitive. And the point is jumping between all these worlds, rearranging them and progressing via the various changes you're able to make. It's a great game. It's also something that I would never have expected from the developer of Limbo and Inside, but it also retains some of those stylistic ideas and I think really comes together well. At number 18 is Sea of Stars, a spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger, and wow, a game that really nails it in terms of that. Every single aspect of Sea of Stars really calls to mind Chrono Trigger and really all of those Super Nintendo JRPGs like Final Fantasy VI, etc. Obviously, most tied to Chrono Trigger. I I'm not going to say the story is as good as Chrono Trigger, nor are the characters, but they certainly weave together an interesting tale that maybe doesn't go out of its way to make itself as relatable as Chrono Trigger can be, but that's okay. I mean, you're comparing a game to Chrono Trigger, which many people consider to be the best game of all time, certainly the best JRPG. It's still a very worthy spiritual successor and a very enjoyable game with an incredibly well mapped out battle system that doesn't just copy, it also adds and creates something worthwhile. 
And number 17 is the Dead Space remake, which takes a different path than Resident Evil 4 and System Shock by keeping it basically the same, but adding little things for coherence and also makes the ship one continuous experience. Beyond that, it's basically identical. Visually, big upgrade. Even some of the gameplay systems get a big upgrade in terms of how they work, but ultimately it feels like playing Dead Space 1 with some Dead Space 2 gameplay stuff thrown in alongside some little additions in the story and the fact that Isaac talks in it that sort of unifies it with Dead Space 2, in my opinion, in a very good way. It's great. Play it. At number 16 is Mortal Kombat 1. Mortal Kombat is a series that seems to revel in confusing you in terms of its story and time and setting, and it doesn't matter at all. It likes to do that, but it probably likes to do that because it knows the reason you keep coming back is because it's a stellar fighter with a bunch of insane crap in it. I'm not even going to try to outline what's going on in the story. I'm not even sure if I get it. And I don't care. I play every one of these games because they keep refining it and making it better and better. And I love Mortal Kombat. And number 15 is Street Fighter 6, which I absolutely learned from the mistakes of Street Fighter 5 and launched ready to go. Street Fighter 5, if you remember, launched with a great fighting engine, great graphics, but almost no content and a lot of modes missing. Street Fighter 6 remedies all of that. This is the full package that everybody should get when they buy a game. And on top of that, in terms of the online, wow, does it work good. Almost no online games at all work this well on launch day. Certainly not incredibly timing-based games like Street Fighter, but they really nailed it. On top of that, they gave you a character creator that's insane. And if you like Street Fighter or fighting games at all, Street Fighter 6 is a must. And number 14 is Dead Island 2, a game that, uh, I'll be honest with you, I had no idea would ever come out. It's one of those games that's changed hands so many times, you just kind of like, ah, can it even be good? And it turns out to be not just good, but great. Dead Island 2 is incredible. Damn Buster made not only a worthy sequel, but expanded on the ideas of the original in such a way that, although there are other zombie games out there that do similar things feels like a cohesive real sequel to a game that a lot of people like i remember talking about this game in like 2015 2016 and i would have never guessed that in 2023 a solid perhaps better sequel would come out that again it, it didn't light the world on fire or anything but i thought really solid game and number 13 is Dave the Diver, a game that combines a lot of genres into one weird thing, to be frank. So you do two things, primarily. Firstly, you're a diver, duh, but you also manage a sushi restaurant and you probably understand the motivation for diving now. But now that just sounds like a collection loop and that ain't it either because there's boss fights, weapons crafting, there's, there's some souls-like elements. I mean, it's just a freaking crazy game. How it manages to be this lunatic mishmash of tons of ideas to the point where it's almost hard to describe. And being fairly complicated, it's also just nice to play. It's also got a really good sense of humor. It's, it's one of those things where there is so much more going on than what your initial look is going to tell you about it. And number 12 is Pizza Tower. Hey, would you like Wario combined with Sonic? There you go. That's Pizza Tower. Pizza Tower is crazy. This game feels like everything that the 90s wanted to be without the self-consciousness of the 1990s. It's just willing to go everywhere and anywhere. It's manic, it's crazy, it's very well designed. And yes, it is every bit as fun as the footage implies. And number 11 is Diablo 4. Yes, Diablo 4. Yes, this game got a ton of hate when it came out for obvious reasons, but that doesn't mean the game itself isn't fantastic. It actually is. I'm not going to pretend for even a second that it is acceptable to have microtransactions up the wazoo and a battle pass in a $70 game, 
But hey, that doesn't stop the game from being good. I think a lot of people ended up saying that they hate aspects of the game that are actually pretty good just because of the anger that other aspects of the game generated. I mean, this is classic Diablo at its best. It's very well designed, got a huge open world, great co-op. There's really no reason to say the fundamentals of Diablo 4 are bad. I'm not going to say that there aren't legitimate reasons to not want to play the game. Yes, always online is going to irritate some people, and I don't think that these things are just hand-wavable, but that doesn't mean that the fundamentals aren't really good. I mean, Diablo 4, if you can get past all the crap, is a really good game. I know somebody's going to say, well, you can't let them get away with it. You have to stand against it, otherwise they're never going to change. And I'm going to say this, they're never going to change. Blizzard has gotten all the negative press that any other developer would ever need to change. So I think it's kind of like, do you enjoy the stuff that works? And do you ignore the stuff that doesn't? Or do you just hate the game? That's kind of Sophie's choice here, if you know what I mean. And number 10 is Sons of the Forest. I don't know what better to say than it's the forest, but much bigger and much better. It is a beautiful game. It is an atmospheric game. It is a game with many possibilities for building and a crazy, weird story that may not shock you if you've been through the original forest. I mean, this game is still in early access. It's not necessarily a complete game yet, and it is beloved by pretty much everybody that plays it. And number nine is The Outlast Trials. This is basically a prequel that takes place during the Cold War where Murkov is doing some experiments. If you know anything about that, it's a very different setting from the first two, but the game itself actually, I mean, builds on a lot of the great ideas from Outlast. Essentially, you have quests or tasks or whatever you want to call them. You got to complete them while not getting killed. You don't really have any offensive weaponry of any kind. Uh, you do have some passive defense like mines, but it's a pretty unique series and it's a pretty good entry into it. At number eight is Dredge, a fishing game that somehow manages to be unsettling. I mean, look at the art style. It's cartoony, it's a little bit whimsical, except the color palette is a little bit dingy. It's a game that kind of feels like several different types of games, but brings them together pretty well. It also manages to instill this sense of dread that this type of game you wouldn't think would be able to. I really enjoy Dredge. It's a very different experience from what it looks like, and a, a very good one. And number seven is Starfield. Yes, there are a lot of people who, I mean, do everything they can to discredit Starfield, and I know that there are more than enough people that will remember me saying a million times, wow, Bethesda needs to move to Unreal already. I'm so tired of the problems of the creation engine. But that doesn't mean Starfield is somehow absent of merit. It's actually a very good game with a lot of interesting stuff if you're willing to go into the Bethesdaverse for it. I saw an article on Forbes talking about Starfield wanting to attempt a Cyberpunk 2077 reputation repair, and I don't really understand why it has to. I think it's gotten extreme hate in areas where maybe it should get mild hate. That isn't to say that Bethesda doesn't need to change and do better, but I mean, it's a Bethesda game. Do I have problems with it due to the nature of it being a Bethesda game? Absolutely. And I think that a Bethesda game needs to be something more going forward from Starfield. But I don't really consider Starfield an unmitigated disaster. Just, I, I mean, it's a lot of interesting content built in a pretty stagnant engine. As much as people hate it, there's actually a lot of great things to see in this game. And I will stand by that statement at very least. And number six is Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon, a game that does everything that it needs to do and does it incredibly well. You got customization, you got a crazy futuristic story, you got the nonsense, but not quite the Kojima level of the nonsense. Armored Core 6 is really just a great game. I love, I love this game. It's also doesn't wear out its welcome. It's a 20 hour game. It's worth every cent because it packs those 20 hours with everything. At number five is RoboCop Rogue City, a game that I don't think that anybody expected would be among the best of the year, even with a cool demo. Uh, I know a lot of people, myself included, played that demo and were like, this is really fun. 
But if it doesn't have some kind of progression in it, it's not going to be enjoyable. And it does have progression in it. It kind of defied expectation in certain ways, being a fresh experience the whole way through. I love RoboCop Rogue City. It is invincible tank man action. I mean, you're not actually invincible. You can die, but it's definitely a power simulator. And man, is it ever fun. It, it's, it's also the follow-up to RoboCop that probably should have happened and never did. And number four is Lies of P, the Pinocchio Souls-like. Yep, when you hear those words in 2022, you're kind of like, mm, what? What the hell are we talking about here? But uh, it is fantastic, and lying actually figures into the narrative. It's so weird that you could make a Pinocchio Souls-like that uses the source material in a way that complements the Souls-like elements and is just an all-around fantastic game. That's what this is, though. And number three is Alan Wake 2. This is, in my opinion, the best game of the year. Yes, I am going to mention two that are perhaps bigger and have merit for others to say maybe are the best games of the year. For me, it's number three, though, Alan Wake 2. This is absolutely the height of what Remedy has decided a game should be. Control, fantastic introduces so many of the things that they take to extremes here, but they also take all of the stuff that they did on Alan Wake so well. Like, it's a game that crystallizes the experience and style of Remedy into an incredible experience that bursts out of every boundary you attempt to put it in. It's scary, but it's a really good story that's complex and interesting and takes characterization to a new level. A lot of people say Saga Anderson is a Mary Sue. Well, she's the most interesting Mary Sue I have ever played in a game, if so. And also, in my opinion, has interesting implications in terms of Alan Wake's writing. If she is indeed a Mary Sue, it's a game where a statement like that actually makes sense to talk about. I don't know, I love Alan Wake too. What a game. And number two is Hogwarts Legacy, a open world game in a franchise, again, I don't care for, but does it very well. It's a very competent, very enjoyable open world Hogwarts. Uh, I don't love the wizarding world. I don't really enjoy Harry Potter, but I did really enjoy exploring Hogwarts in this game. And really a lot of the world here is very cool to see. Just like Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, I actually think it is a game that whether or not you are a fan of the IP is a worthy game to play because uh, uh, it's not going to set the world on fire or anything with its content, but it just is a really competent open world game. And if you like open world games, the ones that really do it well, even if they don't necessarily do anything new are still a little few and far between like there's a lot of open world games that just throw a bunch of shit at the wall to see what sticks and hogwarts legacy is not one of those it's it's a well curated well paced interesting story that makes good use of the open world and finally at number one it's baldur's gate 3 i don't know how you talk about baldur's gate 3 in an abbreviated manner it is Perhaps the most detailed, varied, and granular AAA game ever made. And it is a AAA game. There is some debate as to whether or not it is. It is. It's huge. It's insane. There's so much scale. It cost over $100 million to make. It's really a worthy follow-up to the original Bioware RPGs. But Larian also makes it their own by making it turn-based, and I think it really works. I actually think it might be my favorite of the three Baldur's Gate games. I also have a couple of bonus games for you. Firstly, with Assassin's Creed Mirage. Uh, depending on your expectations for this one, I think is really what is key in going in. I had expectations that this was going to be a triumphant return to the old school Assassin's Creed formula, and in a lot of ways it is, but in a lot of ways it isn't. It does retain a lot from Valhalla in terms of baked in aspects of it, but it also feels a lot more like the original Assassin's Creed games, giving you a lot of, frankly, welcome changes that do remind you that it is an Assassin's Creed game, an old school Assassin's Creed game. Very good if you're not rigidly expecting one thing from it. 
And finally, and to wrap things up, it's Barrow Trauma, which is a 2D underwater survival horror submarine simulator with RPG elements. Yeah, they threw a lot at the wall there, but it, it actually comes together pretty well. In some ways, it reminds me of Fallout Shelter, and in others, it reminds me of Frostpunk, except you actually play as like a character. It's got a little bit more of a sense of humor than Frostpunk, but it is a very interesting game that I'd highly recommend checking out. That's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see the first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.